You can debate about goats in sports all you want, but Chris Broussard is the undisputed goat in sports media. So spare the debate on that. He's a Fox Sports Radio host with The Odd Couple with Rob Parker, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern. He's also seen on Fox Sports 1 with their debate programming. In radio, Chris has the better takes than Rob, but we won't tell Rob about that. Chris, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Fenley. I am so grateful to help you out with updates on your show from time to time. Thanks for making time. Man, it's great to be here. Uh, I, I love your signature saying, hey, you know, that that's you, man. That's you. 30 years from now, when you're a big superstar, that's what people are going to know you as. Hey. Well, and so, uh, but I thank you for that great, that glorious intro, man. Um, that's why you're the star of the big three uh, of our, you know, update anchors on the I couple. The big three is you. Ralph Irvin and David Gascon, those are the big three that side with me. And then Steve DeSager <laughs> side with Rob. But you're the star of the big three. You're the LeBron of the big three. Oh. Well, so uh, I give you love. Well, Chris, you have been a great mentor and a man I look up to. And my goodness, do we have a whole lot of excitement when it comes to basketball that's right in front of us with a bubble and the restart about to take place and also what Lou Williams got himself into. So we've heard the quarantine that he's going to have to face 10 days after a little trip to Atlanta an excused absence and he dropped by a strip club and apparently the food, Chris, is really good there, like really good. He claims he went there for dinner. Are you convinced of that or do you think he was also maybe trying to have a good time? Yeah, I, I look. I've never been to Magic City. Uh, our, our, my partner, Rob Parker, loves it. He's always <laughs> talking about it. He insisted that we have a Magic City Monday theme show That's on right. our show. So I had to insist that we have a Worship Wednesday to balance things out. You know, <laughs> but um, I look, the food, from what people say, it is really good, but I'm sure that was not the main draw, okay? <laughs> it's a bonus that the food is good. Yes. But Lou went there for something else. And there's, you know, that's his prerogative. That's his choice. Um, but, you know, just admit it. Yeah, I went there for the food. And I also went there for the scenery. I mean, just, <laughs> just be honest. You know, we're all big boys. Nobody's going to, you know, uh, you know, jump on you for that. So, yeah. uh yeah, I, look, I think, honestly, a lot of guys leaving the bubble are leaving it. At this point, it's early, right? Yeah. And um, they know that if they miss a few of the regular season games, if they have to, it won't be a huge deal, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the teams that are already assured of making sure. the playoffs and maybe even their team is set. So don't, don't think that a lot of these family absences aren't to see – you know, girlfriends or if they're married, wives, you know, guys yeah. want to get home and, and spend some quality time with their, their honeys, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, or a honey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's, that's probably what's going on. And, you know, you just hope, man, that it doesn't negatively impact the bubble because we see sure. what's happening in baseball. Yeah. And I have to give props to the NBA that they did it, they've done this thing the right way with the bubble. And again, maybe they'll have trouble. We don't know, but I think they've got the best chance of making it work. Yep. You see baseball's already having major issues now. And the Yankees and Phillies just canceled their game tonight. Uh, obviously, the Marlins are, are the main trigger with, what, mm -hmm. 14 positives within their organization. Mm -hmm. They played the Phillies recently, so they canceled that game. So think about the schedule makers. Yeah. I mean, it's now baseball, is, it's, it's, all, it's all in flux. And um, they, it would have been nice. I don't know all the particulars if they could have done it. Uh, but it, it would have been nice if they could have put up two or three or four bubbles Throughout sure. the country and have baseball do it that way. Because if you're in and out of society like the players are, yeah. like the football players will be, it's going to be much tougher than if you're in a bubble like the NBA. 
That's a great point, Chris. How watchful and vigilant, let's say the NBA, can they be to monitor players' every move and actions just to make sure that when guys, you know, go into the bubble, they come out, that they don't do anything, whether it's accidentally or purposefully, to compromise the bubble? Yeah, I mean, look, it's still a free country. Um, and you just hope that the guys are mature enough uh, and prioritize the season and their team ahead of themselves to some degree. You know, human beings are going to do what human beings do. Um, but you just want to, you know, especially in this time, remember there was even talk that the bubble, some players were hesitant about the bubble. It felt like a prison, sure. you know, especially in this with the racial unrest that's going on. Um, so there's always that you can't hinder people's freedom, but, um, you just have to really get the point across to players that look, this is something that's very important. And, and a lot of that's up to the coaches. The league has done its part. They have the, the quarantine days, they've laid down the law. They, you know, they've done all they can. Now it's up to the coaches and the captains on the teams to say, look guys, we have a chance to do something special. You know, um, if you didn't want to be here, then we get it. We will respect that decision, like Avery Bradley with the Lakers, um, and we'll move on. But if you decide to come, know that you're coming to help us win a championship. Sure. And so don't put yourself or others in harm's way. I mean, God forbid if Lou Williams did get the coronavirus and then gave it to Kawhi. Mm. Or, or gave it to Paul George or just gave it to several other teammates. What that could do to jeopardize yeah. the Clippers' chances of winning the championship. Now, again, I think a lot of players are looking at it like, look, it's early. Even if I get it, I don't think they're thinking of it flippantly, but sure, yeah. even if I get it, I, I quarantine for two weeks. We'll still have plenty of time before we get into the playoffs. Sure. And you know what I mean? Certainly deep rounds. So we'll be good if that's the case. So I think a lot of guys are trying to get it out of their system right sure. now until, you know, at the end of the first round, you'll have family members and, and guests be able to come. But, um, you know, you just got to be careful. And again, mm -hmm. hope that guys are smart and responsible about this. And look, obviously the older guys are, the yeah. more veteran they are, they uh, are likely to be smarter and wiser than some of the younger guys who, you know, you're young, you think you can do no wrong and, and nothing's going to touch you. Yeah, you think you're invincible. Chris Broussard, wow. invincible when it comes to his takes. I'm Brian Fenley. Looking ahead to opening night, Chris, as the NBA has their restart, we've got a doubleheader on our hands. How much pressure is there on the NBA to get this right based upon, like you alluded to earlier, the social justice movements, how they handle the pregame activities and all of that? Yeah, look, I think they've done a good job. Obviously, you've got the Black Lives Matter on the court and the players will have their slogans or phrases or words on the back of their jerseys. We've seen players like LeBron and others speak out, you know, during their interviews with the media. They've spoken out about Breonna Taylor and, you know, other – it, it, LeBron even spoke about the Black Lives Movement, a uh, Black Lives Matter movement versus just Black Lives Matter, period, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so uh, I think they're doing a good job. Um, you know, they're known, they have a reputation as a progressive league. And, 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 and credit to the other, like baseball, which doesn't, you know, only is 7% black at this point. But credit to them for you know, players wearing Black Lives Matter jersey or shirts during warm-ups, players kneeling. I really think, Brian, to be honest, um, you know, we're in a nation that's 70% white. And I think it's important when white players um, are wearing like a Black Lives Matter shirt uh, or kneeling during the anthem and showing their support for their fellow Americans. I think that can even be at times more powerful a great than point when the African-American players do it, because, you know, you, you expect the black players to do it. Uh, but when white players who, you know, uh, are obviously a part of the uh, most powerful group in the country, uh, whites, 
do it, then that, that says something. And that's a way uh, that you can push for change. How does the NBA and the media cover this season restart as far as the games adequately and thoroughly while not doing a disservice to the social justice movements? Because you said this just a moment ago, Chris, that players, when they are speaking to the media after these scrimmages, they are devoting it and talking to different causes like Black Lives Matter, as LeBron James has done, as far as Breonna Taylor. How do you adequately deal with that and give them a platform, but also cover the games as well thoroughly? That's a, that's a great question. And it'll be interesting to see how much the players continue to talk about it. You know, once the playoffs come and, and the games really matter, and um, obviously everybody's priority is to win a championship. You're not putting that above the, the, the move for change, the social movement for change. But obviously on an individual level, you know, it's important to these guys to, to try to win championships. So um, it'll be interesting to see how much they continue to speak out, you know, during playoff games. Uh, as opposed to now when games haven't even started or during that eight game run, you know, they aren't the most important games sure. to most of the teams. Uh, as far as a journalist, you know, I think there'll be a few things like ESPN has several reporters there. So, so you will have reporters that are assigned to report on the basketball. And then you'll have reporters that are assigned to report on the social movement. Uh, the Black Lives Matter and the statements and what the players are doing to advance that cause. The challenge, the bigger challenge will be for the outlets where there's only one reporter. Interesting. And so, um, but you'll have to, you know, find a way to weave everything in and that's the challenge. But, you know, I was a guy that wrote game stories for years covering the sure. NBA. Yeah. And, um, you can do it. You can write a game story where you, you adequately cover the game and the action. And yet if a LeBron James says something, uh, you know, that was profound uh, regarding race or, or social justice, you can work that in as well. And, and let's face it. Now it's different nowadays. Um, when I wrote, or even, you know, before I wrote, for the New York Times and other newspapers. Mm -hmm. So technology wasn't as advanced. So a lot of times people reading your story, they were, that was going to be their only source of knowledge as to what happened in the game. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now people will see on ESPN, on Fox Sports, on the debate shows, on radio, on their telephone, internet, you know, Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. they'll see highlights. They'll know who was the leading scorer. They'll know that LeBron had a triple double in leading the Lakers to victory. They won by 20, whatever. Um, and, and so a lot of that they'll already know when sure. they see the reporter on television or um, right in his game story. So you won't have to detail every little uh, machination or every little thing that went on in the game, you can actually write more of a bigger, broader story that may include more about the social justice statements that the players made um, or what have you. And finally, I think that's part of why the NBA has the Black Lives Matter on the court and then the slogans uh, on the mm -hmm. back of the jerseys because it's subliminal. So even as you're playing, you know, and they're playing basketball, you're still seeing vote on the back sure. of the jersey, equality, justice, Black Lives Matter. So it's subliminal. And so even if you have a game or many games where there's nothing mentioned really about the social justice movement, people who are watching the games will still see um, the message loud and clear. I got one more big question for you here, Chris. And on a different note, you've seen how the traditional five in the NBA has gone. I don't know. It's become useless or not as prevalent. And you're seeing bigs shooting threes. 
when do you think that this first started to come and be seen in the NBA? Was it a guy like Antoine Walker, who you've worked with on Fox Sports 1, where you have a big like that stepping out? Was he one of the, the first to do that? Or, or where do you sense that change happened in the NBA? Well, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, and that's, it's interesting. I, I heard Chris Webber, who was a great player, who was about, you know, 6'11", 6'10", 6'11", who uh, could handle the ball. Now, he, in the NBA, he, he mostly played inside, certainly his best years in Sacramento. Sure. But he was a guy that it, he could bring the ball up the court, and occasionally you saw him do that even at the University of Michigan with the 5-5. Five five. Uh, I remember seeing him say that Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, seeing Magic Johnson as a 6'8 point guard, seeing Larry Bird as a guy that was 6'9", 6'10", who was one of the greatest shooters in NBA history, really put the spark in him to think, wow, you know, just because I'm tall, just because I'm a big man, doesn't mean I can't do things on the perimeter. Sure. Um, so they may have initially started. I'm going to educate you, young man. I'm going I'm to take you back. I know you were expecting me to start in like 2013 or something. I'm going to take you back. <laughs> Let's Ralph go. Ralph Sampson. I don't know if you heard of Ralph Sampson. Oh, of course. Yeah, I've heard of Ralph Sampson. <laughs> Ralph Sampson was a tremendous player at Virginia, University of Virginia, and then went to the Houston Rockets with Hakeem Olajuwon. So they had the Twin Towers. So obviously Olajuwon was about 6'10", 6'11". And, and uh, Samson was 7'4". Now Samson was unique in, and this is the mid-1980s. Mm -hmm. And Samson was unique in that he was a big man, obviously 7'4", who loved to play on the perimeter. He liked to run up and down. He liked to shoot the elbow jumper, the, the mid-range jump shot. Uh, he was a finesse player. And at that time, it was somewhat frowned upon. Hmm. You know, people called him soft. And, oh, he don't, he's afraid to bang. Why is he outside? He yeah. needs to get the paint, blah, blah, blah. And so he was one of the early uh, precursors to this as well. And, and an interesting story, um, and this shows you how luck and injuries and so many things can come into play in NBA history, even when we do GOAT rankings and things like that. Yeah. Um, the Houston Rockets with Akeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson in 1986 demolished the Showtime Lakers, beat them 4-1 in the, in, in the, I believe, in the Western Conference Finals that year. They went on to play Boston and lost to Boston in the finals, one of the greatest teams we've ever seen with Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, so on and so forth. Um, but my point is this. It, the following year, Samson got hurt. And so those twin towers really kind of faded mm. after that. And the next year, 87-88, the Lakers won the back-to-back -back championship, sure. the Showtime Lakers. My point is that had Samson not gotten hurt, had he and Olajuwon continued to play together, maybe you, you, would they have continued, would they have beaten the Showtime Lakers again? Wow. You know, or at least one of those years. And would the Showtime Lakers have been this dynasty that won five championships when if – Ralph Sampson and Hakeem Olajuwon had stayed together and been able to be healthy and be in their way. So it's just interesting because things like that happen and um, change the course of NBA history. So, so the, the, we went back to the 80s with some of the bigs. Um, Dirk Nowitzki. Yep. Certainly uh, one of the guys. And, and I, I used to say this about Dirk. Dirk was at his time – one of the few, if not the only, seven-footer at during his heyday that I liked seeing out on the perimeter. Interesting. That I didn't mind playing on the perimeter. You know, I, I like when Dirk was taking threes, when Dirk was handling the ball a little bit, when he was on the perimeter, I, I didn't mind it because he was naturally skilled as a perimeter player. Sure. He grew up as a perimeter player, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, too. 
But then you had other guys like Rasheed Wallace, who with Detroit could step out and hit the three and do it well. He was yeah. a good shooter. But I always was – with Rasheed, I was like, man, you shoot it fairly well, but your bread and butter should be in the paint. It should be a, a, a luxury um, that you can step out and hit the three. Yeah. You can do that to keep the defense honest and things like that. But don't forego the paint. Because sure. Rasheed, as well as he shot it, was not the natural perimeter player that Dirk was. He was an interior player who developed a really good three-point shot. So um, Dirk, and, and here's where really this, a big part of this change took place. You have to credit Dirk, but also European basketball. Interesting. Where, remember in the early 2000s, when America was losing in That's international right. competition. Uh, in 2004, of course, we lost in the Olympics with LeBron and Carmelo and Dwayne Wade and, and all these great players. Uh, and great, and I, I, Iverson and Stephon Marbury, Allen Iverson. Um, and Larry Brown wasn't playing the young guns, but still, we lost. We were losing in you know, a few other competitions, world games and stuff. And a big part of it, and it even dates back to 2000 when we won with Kevin Garnett, Vince Carter, Allen Houston, all those guys. We won gold, mm -hmm. but Lithuania pushed us. Interesting. They, they gave the U.S. a scare. And it was all based on from 2000 on up to when, the, when European teams began beating Americans. It was based on the three ball. And they were shooting three-pointers. They couldn't match us inside on the post. Mm -hmm. They couldn't match us in the transition game. But they, they were trading, giving up twos and hitting threes. And they were driving and kicking. They were driving and kicking. And they didn't have the same athletic talent that America had. But that three-point ball was a great equalizer. And so... That really uh, changed things. And America, you know, began looking at that and, and picking that up. And slowly but surely, it crept into our game. And the three-pointer, you know, became a huge part of the game. And remember, what did they, what did they do in Europe? In Europe, they would train players all the same. Whether you were seven feet tall uh, or even as a youngster, if you're a six foot tall, sixth grader, or seventh grader, mm -hmm. you're doing the same perimeter drills as the young, the little guards. Everybody's handling the ball. Everybody's shooting threes. Everybody's passing. Everybody's doing the same stuff. So you saw many European players. Dirk was obviously the first and, and the greatest, but uh, we got now Christoph Porzingis. You had. Um, Andrea Bargnani, who never really nice. panned out as a star, but, you know, was a perimeter, seven-footer who could shoot on the perimeter. Uh, you had Nikola Mirotic, who's still in the league. So you've had several European players who are tall, even uh, Nikola Jokic, who is yeah. tremendous and does has guard skills. He played point guard the other night in their scrimmage. That's right. And so uh, the Europeans – really are the ones that started the trend of having – I mean, I wouldn't say started because obviously I went back to the Magic and Bird. Sure. But they, in the modern era, they kind of popularized uh, and began this, this latest trend wow. of seven foot pipes playing on the perimeter. And um, Americans have obviously picked it up. And so that's really – I think that that's, you know, a long-winded answer, but yeah. those are kind of the various steps that have led us to where we are today. And now you saw bowl, bowl. Um, right. You know, you've got all these seven-footers handling the ball, doing it on the perimeter. And I think what's important, Brian, for these guys is you have to know your game and know your strengths. And so a Joel Embiid who – is seven feet tall and likes to play on the perimeter a lot and shoot threes. Again, kind of harkening back to what I said about Rasheed Wallace, I'd rather see Embiid on the block. 
I'd rather see a steady diet of Joel Embiid punishing people on the block in the post because nobody can stop him down there. He's not a great three-point shooter. He's a big man who's a decent three-point shooter. Again, every once in a while, it's nice to be able to step out, keep the defense honest. But his bread and butter should be on the post. And whereas then you look at, you know, some other seven-footers, a Kevin Durant. Love seeing him on the perimeter because he's natural there. That's, that's his game. So you have to know your game. Giannis is the evolution of basketball. And a seven-footer who the only thing he doesn't do well is shoot the three, and he's getting better at that. Once he – if he continues to improve that three-point shot, and if he gets to a point where he's like a 36, 37% three-point shooter, it may be over. I mean, how what how are you going to stop him? And I'll tell you something else. Ben yeah. Simmons, I love Ben Simmons' game as that type of player. We know he doesn't shoot well, but if you play him in a role like Giannis, where he's handling the ball, sometimes he's posting, and you put shooters around him, man, he could be mad, madly effective. And um, so it's it's interesting the way the places that the game is going. That's the thing about Chris Broussard. You hang out with him, you are around his presence, and your IQ shoots to the roof. The guy is full of knowledge, and my goodness, Chris, I learned a lot from you. Your dedication to the history of the game is phenomenal, is phenomenal. And I see a lot of – No, you kids just don't know. So they I don't. <laughs> Thank goodness for Chris Broussard to step in and, and tell those kids – the truth. Chris Broussard does a show, The Odd Couple with Rob Parker. Make this a regular part of your daily routine on Fox Sports Radio from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, seen on FSR Affiliates, Sirius XM Channel 83, the iHeartRadio app. Also, Chris is all over social media and Fox Sports 1. Chris, I am so grateful that you had a couple minutes during your busy day to, to chat with me and talk some hoops, and I will see you on Tuesday. That's right, man. I'm looking forward to it. Keep up the great work, man. You got a bright future ahead of you, and I'm glad you're part of the uh, I Couple team. <laughs> <laughs>